Welcome back to the Unrest Podcast. I'm Caitlin Stansel. And I'm Madeline Green. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Unrest Podcast. If you haven't subscribed, please do so, so you can stay up to date with all of our real life haunts. We do a new one every week. We're not sure what day it'll be every week, but at least it will be every week. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to keep you on your toes. <laughs> yes, yes. And if you haven't already, join us in the Unrest Podcast Facebook group. We have a lot of fun content happening over there. And Madeline, before we get started on this week's real life haunt, I wanted to yeah, talk I'm still about, not about this. <laughs> her recent meme that she posted asked, which movie would you get rid of? And the choices were Hocus Pocus, Halloween, Beetlejuice, and what was the fourth one? The Adams Family. I said I would just get rid of Halloween. First of all, I feel like it doesn't really fit with the other three. Okay, you're right. It definitely doesn't fit, but that's a classic. Like I love a classic, gory, scary movie like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm all for it. I don't know. Halloween, I really don't even know if I've seen the whole thing through. <laughs> you know, there's like multiples. I just, I don't know. I've always loved Halloween and the whole concept I don't know it just I don't know I've just always <laughs> liked that and I picked Beetlejuice because I don't think I've ever even seen Beetlejuice oh Beetlejuice is really good you act you need to see it because I, I know you would like it favorite. I know you would like it so tell us about this week's real life haunt so this week's real life haunt is coming from Demi and she has sort of had a sensitivity um, to the paranormal for quite some time, but she recently took a trip with a group to Germany and they visited one of the concentration camps and she had an interesting experience there. Take a listen. I'm Debbie. I am, I have like a touch with spirits and stuff like that. I'd like to say, and I was overseas in Europe, in Germany specifically, and we were going to visit some Holocaust memorials and concentration camps to kind of like see how it was. And I knew going to these uh, places, I would be somehow touched or affected by them. So I was fully like ready to experience and everything like that, which then caused my experience to kind of go a little bit out of hand at one of the locations. So the first experience was at this memorial built over the bunker of one of uh, Adolf Hitler's just like groups. And they did not know that at the time, but an, a couple artists were um, commissioned to make these concrete six foot long, four foot wide, maybe like boxes that grew in height to be like probably over like 15 to 20 feet tall. Okay. And they were kind of like wide, like coffins They're to represent some, like it was specifically for Jews. So they're representing how Jewish people, but past and everything. And as you walked into it, it got lower and the corners got tighter. So it was trying to convey the fear and uneasiness with whatever's going next. Where am I going? What am I going to run into? And it, very much did its job it was very abstract though and while I was walking through it I felt this like uneasy pressure as you're supposed to but then I also felt like I had these chains around my wrists dragging me down and it was very hard to even lift my hands to take a picture down the rows I had one of my friends following behind me who was also there when I had my second experience and I was with a, a tour group of about 25 so I was surrounded by people, yeah, and I was the only one that felt everything going on around me and all that kind of stuff like that. Before I knew what was happening, like, way back when, I'd be alarmed. But now it's kind of like, okay, this isn't terrible. Show me more because I know somebody's here that's not rested and they need to be able to communicate how they're feeling. So I was kind of like, yeah, okay, like, let me feel how you felt a little bit. Not too much, but, like, give me a little bit more. So as I kept walking into the depths of, like, the thing, the chains got heavier. 
And by the time I was walking out of it, it was so hard to like pull my hands out because they were trying to like, no, wait, like we need someone to feel, you know? So it was just kind of, it was, it's always a pulling experience whenever it happens. And it was only on my wrists. So uh, I think it was a day or two later, we went to Dachau or Dachau. Um, I say with German accent because I took German and that's why I was there. And it was the first concentration camp, like the very first one. Um, there was no like, there was no, the gas chamber was built there, but it was never used. But the crematorium was used. Uh-huh. So walking through where all the housing was, I kind of like felt extreme exhaustion and hunger and fatigue. And we were walking back towards the crematorium. My first, before it led to my massive experience, I was standing in front of one of the crematorium furnaces and I just started crying. It was just, but it was silent. And I'm just standing there staring at these incinerators like, oh my God, they just pushed people in there and dumped their ashes on the floor. Like that freaked me out. And I had to rip myself away from that. So then I went outside walked around for a few minutes and made our way towards the wall. I knew that is where I would be the most affected because people actually did die in those spots. And it was in the back and they would line everybody up and they would just shoot them in the head until they died where they laid. And when I walked back there, I was already feeling emotional and upset. And I knew there was some clinging on to me already And when I got back to the wall, I walked right up to it and I like could see where the line was, where most of people's heights were, because there was a bunch of like indentations in the concrete where bullets, if they went through, would pass through. Um, And I got heavier from there and I just felt sick. Um, And as we went further down the path, there was a couple other small memorials towards them. And so we got to the end of the wall where there was a drain ditch for the blood. And I turned away from that and I just felt like I was trying to, like there was liquid in my lungs and it was trying to come out of my mouth. And then I felt like liquid was just pouring out of my throat and out of my mouth down on my face. And then I couldn't breathe. I started choking up and panicking because I'm like, oh my God, I can't breathe. Oh my God, I can't breathe. And then my head started pounding in the back very quickly. And then I just started sobbing, like, hysterically. I took, like, maybe a couple steps. There was a bench nearby, so I, like, looked at my friend. I'm like, I I can't go. I I need to sit down. And I sat down, and I sobbed for a good two or three minutes. And then it just stopped on a dime. Gone instantly. Sitting there taking in what I just felt, what just happened, apologize to my friend because I know like they were right there and trying to comfort me. I could tell they were there. I could not feel them. I was in such a state of distress and panic that the jewel had felt. I could not understand that I was in the present moment. And um, actually I work with a deity that works with spirits. So I think that's another reason why I'm super sensitive to this stuff. And I felt their hand on my shoulder where it always goes, and that's when it stopped. They physically separated both of us, all of us. They were like, nope, she's had enough. Let her go. And it, they let me go, but I know a couple of them still had held on to me until I left. And I had to, like, try and cleanse them off of me before we got to our bus because I could feel them holding on to my spine, like, trying to drag me back, like, no please don't leave that kind of stuff like that. So it kind of just shook me up the rest of the day and I tried to get it off of me as best I could, but it still was very difficult to walk away from that location because there was so much unrest and anger and just, and just sadness that I really felt like I need to go back for, like I need to go back there and spend another day there. I know that for sure. Cause I only got like 10 minutes back there. So I guess, how did you become aware of your sensitivity to the spirit world it was by accident i'm gonna be blunt i was going through a large breakup and i was very not myself and distracted and everything and i felt another type of deity or spirit connect with me 
and it brought my attention to it. And as I, you know, looked further in the internet, like, what is this feeling? I realized I've been feeling it my entire life. I would get reoccurring paranormal dreams. I would get serious deja vu. Um, and I would get serious nightmares of these just gangly, gnarly creatures. And it was always the same one. So it kind of has always been there, but I didn't quite realize it until I got into a different aspect of the spirit realm. And it just has developed from there because my first like big time interacting with the spirit was a deceased family member. And we were trying to find out where my grandfather's naturalization papers were. And I had to call upon them and be like, hey, can you help us out? And they were there. And we didn't find them, but it gave us, she gave us a ton of ideas. And it, I know it was her and stuff like that. She was really trying, but during the last parts of her life, like dementia was setting in. So she probably did not remember correctly, but she really did try. I guess what would be your message to other people who may be experiencing this sort of thing, but not understanding it? Do your research. Uh, don't dive into things head first unless you feel like you absolutely can. I looked into a couple little things first and then I looked into more and then I checked back on to learn with what I was feeling and it kind of devolved from there. Um, do not trust every spirit you interact with though. Find those couple spirits if you are going to interact with them. Find those couple spirits you know are safe for you and work with them. If you can build up this sort of trusting bond or give and take relationship with them, without doing anything stupid, you know, um, do it, especially if you want wish to continue working with spirits and stuff like that, because it can be very dangerous. A couple of those spirits that were holding on to me were very angry, and it took a lot out of me to be able to shake them off, especially when I had nothing to my disposal of cleansing or anything like that. It kind of opens your eyes a little bit. I'm more open to a lot of things in life, actually, and it's helped me understand like, yo, it's kind of there and you have to learn to live with it. Even if you die, there's many things that can happen afterward. We just don't fully understand it. And the closer you get to the idea of death, the more peaceful it'll come to you. I, it's just like now me, I know I I fear death for a very long time and I still slightly do, but I know for the fact that when I die, I know there's going to be something waiting for me, for sure. I don't know why. I don't care what. I just know that these spirits that are with me are going to be waiting for me. And it's kind of comforting to know that I've set something up for myself almost in the future. And maybe even I could be a spirit and help somebody else out, you know? So what was your biggest takeaway from your experience in Germany? Not everything is resolved. Like they're teaching correctly. They're memorializing correctly. But it's just, it's the unrest that lies in these locations that are still very much tainted and hurt with and scarred with what happened there. And to treat these places with the utmost respect. I had a couple people in my group doing the exact opposite of that. And I almost lost my marbles on them. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of, please respect wherever you tread because you don't know what history has been there. Not at all. Just be careful with spirits. That's all I can say. They may come off as friendly at times, but sometimes they're not. I, that's all I can say about that. I know when I was there, there was a spirit that I thought was a child trying to hold on to me, but it took all of my effort to get them off of me because they just wanted a way out of this location. And I felt very bad about it in the end, but I did not want them latching and going to a whole other place that they do not know, do not recognize, and bringing them into another aspect of places. So just be careful with whatever you do with all the spiritual stuff in life. What I find so interesting about her story is, you know, she says that she's had this sensitivity to the paranormal And it's something that she thinks that spirits sort of latch onto, that they can recognize the sensitivity in her. And she's grown more comfortable with it through the years. Can you just imagine, I I know we haven't really heard very many people 
feel these sensitivities, um, obviously, because we don't live near those areas. But can you imagine all of the spirits and just people who are still trapped there because it was such a terrible place? So, uh, you know, I 100 percent believe that, you know, something was probably going on and she was feeling this negative emotion because it is such a negative place. Yeah. And I mean, talk about unrest and peace. I mean, this is an area that has had such tragedy and turmoil and violence. I mean, this is certainly if, if those bodies were, were buried, you know, this certainly is an area though, where, you know, they found that peace that we all hope to find when we die one day. Yeah. So definitely one of those stories that kind of makes you think and realize, you know, the, the devastation that did take place at some of these places and how, you know, it still happens even today. Well, and I think even if you don't have a sensitivity to the spirit realm, I think you would still feel Right. Some of these sort of emotions going to a place like that. I know I would at least. Even someone who isn't sensitive probably still feels that just dread. And then just imagine mm-hmm. how much someone who is sensitive feels that. I mean, even visiting like the 9-11 Memorial, for instance. I mean, just as soon as you walk on that site, you just have a somber feeling. Mm-hmm. Because you're thinking about all that happened that day. Sort of imagining yourself in those people's shoes. and you almost have to like make yourself not think too far into it because it can be very emotional to visit places like that. So I just really appreciated um, Demi being so open and sharing, you know, this experience that she had there. And this week we actually have a bonus story. This story was written in by Tara and she wants to share with us a little bit about a paranormal experience that she had. We had a really close friend overdose in our house. We were absolutely devastated. Well, a few weeks later, after his death, some really odd things began happening around the house. But not wanting to think it was his spirit, I would just rationalize them away. But then things began to get even weirder. Usually they say animals are very perceptive to the spirit world, and our dog never really acted any different. Looking back, I think it's because he knew our friends so well and his spirit did not cause him any distress. His presence only lasted a few weeks until finally I had had enough. One night, the TV stereo turned to the highest volume possible and scared me to death. Out loud, I told him that he was scaring me and asked if he could please stop, that it was starting to really upset me. Nothing ever happened again after that. I'd like to think that he finally passed over. What a sad story. (laughs) I mean, as she said, first of all, what a devastating circumstance for that all to begin. I don't know how you even get over a good friend, not just dying in your house, but overdosing in your home. Um, But then also just kind of sad that it sort of didn't end on a really high note, you know, right. You know, she's asking him to leave because he's starting to scare her and upset her at night and stuff like that. So definitely a very interesting story. And, you know, usually you hear of people in, you know, almost welcoming that spirit because it's almost like a comfort and this, I don't feel that. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, ultimately the goal is that we all pass over when we die that we're not stuck lingering around. So maybe it was all for the best that it ended the way that it did. Well, thank you everyone who shared their story for this episode. We want to hear from you guys though. If you have a story that you think everyone would enjoy or find very, very spooky, we would love for you to write in to the unrest podcast at gmail.com. Especially if you have a Bigfoot story, that's what we're looking for next. We've got a couple of alien stories. Now we need a Bigfoot story. Um, And something I love about Charleston, if all of you out there listening, um, if you've never been here, there is at least one Bigfoot like cut out in the marsh. And sometimes you can see it 
uh, if you're looking out for it, driving towards Folly Beach. So if you ever visit, look out for the Bigfoot cutout here. That's so fun. I want a Bigfoot cutout. <laughs> it might be a little scary. So if anyone wants to send me a Bigfoot cutout, I'll give you my PO box. <laughs> <laughs> Also, you can follow us on Facebook, join our Facebook group where we have a lot of extra unique content there. You can engage with some of the fun memes we've got going on. And just realize if you answer with something I don't agree with, I'm going to be pissed. (laughs) As I said, we like to engage with those who respond. But until next time, unrest unrest in in peace. peace. The Unrest, the Unrest, the Unrest Podcast, 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 Podcast.